Before we come to God's word, let us stand to sing together 145, 1 to 3, and then 5. to the New Testament scriptures, to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to begin reading actually at verse 17 of chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 through chapter 5. Let us hear God's word. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, 
that mortality might be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to glory on our behalf, that you may have something to answer those who, are, who glory in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are of a sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ constrains us. Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The disconnect between religion and life seems to be no more pronounced, no more evident than in Christianity, even evangelical Christianity. Why is it that the adherence of false religions and cults tend to live as though their creeds are true, and yet so many professed followers of Christ live as though what they believe really is irrelevant to life. We can blame, I suppose, this postmodern world in which we live that has no open doors between the various compartments of life. We can blame whatever we want. But the bottom line is that true Christianity is more than just a creed. It's more than just a confession. It's a way to live. It is a way of life. A way of life, and there is no part of life that should not be and ought not be touched by Christ. Christians must learn to live as though Christianity is real. And the connect between creed and life, between doctrine and duty, is a theme that is constant throughout the scripture and certainly is a predominant message when we come to the letters of the Apostle Paul and particularly now in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is unquestionably the most personal of all of the Pauline letters. 
The Apostle Paul was being attacked. His character was being impugned. His motives were under suspicion. And Paul found it necessary in this particular letter to the Corinthians to defend himself against the various accusations that were being leveled. And as he defended himself, he found it very unattractive to do so because he was calling attention in many ways to himself when he would rather be preaching Christ and Christ alone. But his ministry, he recognized, was inseparably connected to what people thought of him. So for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the ministry that he had not only to the Corinthians but around the known world, he found it necessary to defend himself. And in this most personal of books, we have what it is that made Paul tick. What it is that motivated him in the ministry and in the life that he lived. And I think there are lessons for us here that will teach us what it is to live as though what we believe is really true, to live in the reality of what we profess to believe. The text that I've read today certainly is too expansive for a single sermon, but that's never stopped me before. So we're going to come and look at this text in its entirety, in overview, but I want us to learn some principles. I want us to learn what it is to keep our religion real. And that's my theme this morning, keeping religion real. And there are three thoughts, three imperatives, if you will, that we can outline from this climax of Paul's own testimony that will teach us what it is to keep religion real. I say, first of all, that we are to keep eternity in view to keep eternity in view. We see this in the closing verses of chapter four as Paul speaks of the light affliction that was but momentary. Now you think of the afflictions that the apostle experienced. Shipwrecked, he was stoned, he was beaten, he was under attack, but yet he's able to say these light afflictions are just momentary. And they're momentary in the light of eternity. Paul here confesses that there was something beyond time and circumstance that was more real to him than the things of experience. He's teaching us to keep eternity in view. Keeping eternity in view will put the present in proper perspective. The life that we have is God's gift to us. You read Ecclesiastes, and over and again, the preacher there is telling us that this life is for our enjoyment, that this life is for our use, this life is for our good. We are given a life as a gift of God. But the life that we have in this time is fit for this time. The life is not fit for eternity. So looking at the life, looking at eternity and the reality of eternity helps us put the present in perspective. It reminds us and teaches us that life is temporary and that death is certain. I think of that refrain in Psalm 49 where the psalmist says something to this effect that man in his honor abides not or does not remain. He's like the beasts that perish. And the word remain, the word abide, has the idea of spending the night. Man's life is nothing more than a night's sleep. Spending the night. How brief it is. How brief it is. And he's like the beasts that perish, those domesticated beasts that are raised to be slaughtered destined to die. And so it is that man, his life, no matter how long, no matter how short that life is, is nothing more than 
a spending of the night. We all can look back at our own life. Some of us have longer lives now than others that are here. But I can look back at my life. And things that happened when I was just a youngster seem to be so very vivid in my ministry, in, in my memory. Like it was yesterday. How quick, how quickly life passes. Life is brief and death is certain. But life is also burdensome. Paul tells us something of his burdens there, all of this affliction that he was blowing off because compared to nothing in the light of eternity. But nonetheless, there was affliction. There was trouble, and life is filled with trouble. Job says, yeah, it's like the spark. Man is born to trouble like the sparks fly upward. Trouble and sorrows and struggles. But that shouldn't surprise us. You notice Paul speaks here in verse 1 of this tent, this earthly house, this tent that is being destroyed. He's referring to his body. There is light interesting that our English word skin comes from this word that's translated tent. We're living in a tent. Our skin is but a tent, if I can use the imagery here suggested by the very word. We're living in a tent. We're camping out, right? We're camping out. When you live in a tent, you're camping out and, and you go to rough it, all right? You're going to rough it uh, and, and yeah. You don't expect the luxuries. You don't expect all the conveniences because you're in a tent, you're in the wilderness. And Paul says, this is what we are. This, this, we're, we're living in a tent. We're living in a tent. But yet, we tend to live sometimes as though this tent is all there is. We're taken up trying to make the tent existence as comfortable as we can make it, to make it attractive. So we spend all of our effort on the things and the stuff of life. But Paul says that when we realize that this is but a tent that we're living in, it ought to create a desire for complete redemption. Salvation is ultimately about the body as well as it is the soul. And Paul speaks here of groaning. In this tent we're groaning, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. Oh, death is going to come. And he speaks of even the wonder of a believer's death to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. It's going to happen to us all. Absent from this body, to be present with the Lord. I don't want to get into all of the theology here of life after death, but you know that when we die, we enter into what is known as the intermediate state. Our bodies remain on earth. Our bodies corrupt and our bodies decay. Not a pleasant sight. Not a pleasant sight. Not a pleasant thought. But our spirits, our spirits as believers are in the very presence of the Lord. But the day is going to come. And Paul is saying here, I'm not, I'm not satisfied with this intermediate state just to be absent from body, to be present with the Lord. No, we're longing for this day. We desire to have a new body, to be clothed. Not with a tent anymore. Not with this temporary dwelling anymore. But we long to be clothed with that house. That house made without hands, eternal in the heavens, looking for the resurrection. Paul's anticipating the resurrection when that body, long dead and long decayed, is now raised up with a body like unto his glorious body, and now forever, body and soul united. I say redemption is not just for the soul, redemption is for the body. As well, and Paul is anticipating, he's groaning, this impulse, this long and ardent desire he has for the eternal state, the eternal state, when body and soul are brought together. 
God has so made us. God has so made us that nothing in time, nothing in time can ultimately satisfy. I think of Ecclesiastes again in that third chapter, beautiful chapter, you know it, with God, everything has a season, everything has a time. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to mourn, a time to laugh. All of these different times that God has ordained for our experience. And then he concludes that he has made everything beautiful, literally he's made everything appropriate in its time. And he has set the world. King James says he sets the world in our heart. I don't know what the New King James says there. He has said, he took, but the word world there is really the word, word eternity. It's a word almost everywhere else in the Old Testament that's translated eternity. He has set eternity in the heart. God has made us eternal beings. And therefore the only thing that can ultimately satisfy, the only thing that can ultimately bring that contentment is the eternal. But yet we get so taken up with time we get so taken up with the stuff of time and the things of time, and we think that we're going to see something out there, we want something that is going to... But have you ever noticed that what you want and you get what you want, ultimately it doesn't satisfy? It doesn't satisfy. The things of life, the things of experience in this world, will never, can never ultimately satisfy us. A lot of stuff I want. You know, we, we have wanters. We all have wanters, right? We have wanters. And we, we, we want stuff, and we want stuff, and then we, if, if I can just get that, oh, everything will be good. But we get what we want, and all of a sudden we want something else, right? And we, it, it loses. It, it loses. It's not no secret. I, I, like, I like to hunt, and I like firearms and weapons and whatever, and sometimes I'll tell my wife, you know, I, I, just, I just need, I, I need a, a, a new gun, or I need a new bow, or I need this. I, and, and she, she, she believes me, right? She believes me. And so I, I get this thing that I, that I so desperately needed. I, I didn't need it. I, I've got more stuff than I know what to do with. But they're, they're social creatures, and they need fellowship guns, right? They, but the, 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 point, the point is that, you know, I, I want it, and I got it, and then before long, I wanted another one, right? There's nothing in time that satisfies. Not, but the only thing, therefore, that can ultimately bring contentment, the only thing that can ultimately bring satisfaction is eternal, and the only eternal thing is God. God. So here is Paul. Here's what makes me tick, Paul says. It's not the stuff of time. That's why I can look at all of this stuff, and even though it's painful, and even though it's burdensome, ah, uh, here's what I'm longing for. I'm longing for that glorified body, a desire, a desire for heaven. And that's our creed. All right, isn't that our creed? Uh, we, we all understand that heaven is a wonderful place filled with beauty and grace, whatever that old song says. We, we believe that, all right? That's our creed, but yeah, let's cut through it. All right, let's cut through it. If we really believe that, that if we really believe that heaven is better than earth, a, a house instead of a tent, no decay, eternal, heavenly, from God, like Christ. And why, why do the stuff of, of life become so attractive to us? What are the cares of this world so consumers? Yet they do. Keep eternity in view. And then that is going to translate. That will translate into time, for it inspires a confident living for Christ. To keep eternity in view will inspire, I say, a confident living for Christ. Walk by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. It's faith that lays hold to reality. It's faith that looks beyond just the stuff that we can see with the physical eye. To lay hold of reality, to know that God is more real than anything else that is. To know that his word is inviolably true. To trust him. This faith is not just wishful thinking. Faith is not just some narcotic that we take or that we employ to get us through all 
of the hard stuff of life. No, it's faith that lays hold of the object that is true and firm and reliable. Yeah, I see, I see all of this stuff, but we walk by faith and not by sight. And, and we're going to enjoy then the down payment that God has given to us. The guarantee, verse 5, he's given to us the spirit as a guarantee, as a down payment, as the earnest of our expectation. We have heaven. We have heaven as our expectation. But he's given to us the spirit even now to indwell us. Every believer has the gift of the spirit of God to indwell that constant, unceasing, abiding presence of the Spirit of God within the heart of every genuine believer as a down payment, as an earnest, as the guarantee of what is to come. It's interesting, now this is not the biblical usage of the word, but I think it is interesting that this word that is translated here as a guarantee. In later Greek, became the word for an engagement ring. Not that way in the New Testament, but I think it gives an interesting illustration here. It became the engagement ring. Those of you who are married, remember the day when you men, when you uh, proposed and, and, and you gave a ring to your now wife. I remember the day when that happened to me, when I, when I gave that ring to Sandra. Uh, she knew she had me, yeah. and she was right, and she was right. It became the doubt, it became the pledge, and God has given to us the spirit, dare I say, as an engagement ring, that which is the guarantee, that which is the pledge of eternity with him. And so we live to please him. We are confident, verse 8, whether in body or soul, to be present with the Lord. Verse 9, that we might live well-pleasing to him, to please him, to love him, to please him. Because we love him, because we, see, we want to do those things that are pleasing to him. To avoid those things that are not pleasing to him. And we know that from his word. Ultimately, what else matters eternal life in Christ to keep our eternity in view. Puritans used to argue that you ought to have eternity stamped on your eyelids so that everything that you look at in time, everything that you look at in time is put within the perspective of eternity. Read through the book of Ecclesiastes sometime. Yes, here's this life that God has given to us, but this life this life makes sense. This life can be fully enjoyed only with a view to eternity. You to keep religion real. You keep eternity in view. But the second thing that we learn from the text in Paul's testimony is that we keep accountability in mind. We keep accountability in mind. Verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And I suppose there's more nonsense that circulates around this passage than truth. Dispensationalists will play upon this judgment seat of Christ and put it in their eschatological chart. You ever see those? Those eschatological charts with arrows going up and arrows going down and this happening, that happening. Well, here's the judgment seat. They argue that the church is gone, judgment seat of Christ, Israel's being beat up on earth while this is taking. Missing the point. Missing the point. This is not in an eschatological context. It's mentioned a couple times. Paul mentions the judgment seat of Christ in Romans as well, where we're going to stand before him. Not in a context of eschatology, but in a context really of our death that we meet with the Lord. So we can't interpret this in a theological vacuum. I don't know all that's going to be dealt with, but I know my sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. Sins past and sins present, sins future. 
even my unconfessed sins, ultimately under the blood. This is not people's court. This is not people's court. Remember as a kid, hearing sermons on this passage, one of those passages as a kid, you know, I hear all oh, the preach. Oh, man, I don't want to hear that. Right? I don't want to hear that. Uh, and invariably, I, I, I was, the way it was presented when I was growing up, that here, you ever hear this? That there, we, we stand at the judgment seat and there's going to be like a big movie screen. Right? A big movie screen is there and all of my thoughts and all of my actions was going to be there plastered on that movie screen for everybody to see. You ever hear that? I, that's how I grew up. You, you, you hear that. And I remember, to this day, I remember hearing that, and my response was, man, I, I, I don't want my mother to know that. Right? I don't want my mother to know that. Missing the point. It's not between me and the world. This judgment seat's between me and Jesus. And it'll be between you and Jesus. But what a sobering thought that is. What a sobering thought that is, that the day is going to come when we stand before Christ, and accountability, and accountability. And that accountability fosters a fear of the Lord. Verse 11, therefore, knowing the terror, unhappy translation there. Terror has a very negative uh, connotation. Uh, the fear of the Lord, knowing the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord becomes a, a, a phrase in the scripture that defines really the very essence of what true religion is. It's a fear that is based upon the knowledge of God, who he is, based upon the knowledge of what he commands and what he desires, and therefore the awe and the reverence that we give to him, that we owe him in our worship, but also the demonstration of the ethics, how we behave because we fear him, aware of him. The fear of God is the awareness of God, living in the awareness of God, the reality of God, knowing what it is to factor God into all of the circumstances and all of the issues of life. But here's this awareness then of the divine reality that is connected here to this accountability that we have before God. We're going to appear. We must appear. We, it is necessary. It is a necessity for us to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He's our Lord. We're his servants. He's the owner. He's the master. And we're the stewards of his goods. There must be an appraisement. There must be an assessment. I must say that it's no secret. I can't really hide it from folks that I'm getting older. And the realization that the day in which I will stand before Jesus is approaching quickly. I don't know when, but it's coming. It's going to come for you as well. Going to come. Some of you that are younger may be there before I. I don't know. We don't know what life is. But I have to acknowledge that there's more, there's more of my ministry that's behind me than ahead of me, for sure. For sure. What a sobering thought. What a sobering thought to know that I'm going to stand before Jesus and how I long. Don't you long to hear from Jesus, well done? Thou good and faithful servant. That's sobering. This is not a club to beat us up. Not a club to make us quit that or do something else. But it's thorough. There's nothing that God already doesn't know about me. Hebrews says, right, that all things are open and naked before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God knows. There's not a, nothing about us. Nothing about us that God doesn't know. He knows us completely now. Read Psalm 139. There's no place that you can escape from him. No place too high, no place too low. God knows us. 
He knows us thoroughly. All things are open and naked before the eyes of him with whom we have to do, and here is the context in which we have to do with him. Going to appear is not just showing up. The word that's translated there, appear, is not just a showing up. It's the idea of being completely open, completely manifest. Nothing hidden. But it's Christ's estimation of us that ought to motivate us. And Paul used that as an encouragement to have a pure testimony then before men. Look what he says there. Knowing therefore the fear of the Lord we persuade men. But we are well known to God and also trust are well known in your consciences. That's an amazing statement to make. Because we know the fear of the Lord we persuade men. Persuade men of what? Oh, the gospel, sure. Sure. But that's not the context. That's not the context in which Paul is saying he really defines what he means by persuading men in the next statement. We are known by God completely. God knows us completely, and I trust are known in your conscience. And what's Paul doing in this book? In this book of 2 Corinthians, Paul is seeking to persuade men of his integrity. He's seeking to persuade men of the sincerity and the purity of his own ministry before God. Persuade men of what God already knew. I think that's the most amazing statement. Most powerful testimony that I could ever think of. I'm telling you what. I would be happy. I would be content if the only thing God knew about me was what people knew about me. Yeah? What a sigh of relief that would be if the only thing God knew was what people knew. But Paul is saying, no, I want you to know me as God knows me. I want you to know me as God knows me. And if you know me as God knows me, then all of these accusations, all of these innuendos about me and my ministry and my motives and my integrity are going to be out the door. You keep accountability in view. And you live in that reality. Yeah. You live in that reality. That God is real and that he knows us and we're going to stand before him. That ought to direct and motivate life. And the third motive that Paul gives to us is this. We are to keep eternity in view. We are to keep accountability in mind. And finally, we are to keep the gospel in focus. To keep the gospel in focus. This really is the sum. If I had to sum up the closing verses 14 to the end of the chapter, it would simply be that the Apostle Paul just flat out could not get over being saved. He couldn't get over the fact that he was saved. The love of Christ. See that in verse 14? The love of Christ constrains us. Oh, certainly he loved Christ. But he's not talking about here about his love for Christ. He's talking about Christ's love for him and for his people. The fact that Christ loves us, which is evident from the way he demonstrated that love, he died for us, so the focus here is upon the manifestations of Christ's love. But Paul says the fact that Christ loves us constrains us. The word constrain is elsewhere used for arresting. Someone is arrested, put in custody, put in prison. It hems them in. So Paul is saying here that the love of Christ has arrested him, has put him in prison, and here he is now, he's, he's behind the bars, and he's holding on. Can you see the imagery there? He's in this prison of the love of Christ, and he's holding on the bars, and everything he sees then is seen through the love of Christ. Arrested. And Paul here 
gives us then a delineation of all of the implications and evidences of that love of Christ that was shown and proven by the fact that he died for us. You're going to be seeing union with Christ and regeneration and reconciliation and just all of these gospel truths are just heaped one on top of the other. But I sum it up in three or four statements. If we keep the gospel in focus, first of all, it's going to give us a new motivation. It's going to give us a new motivation for life. He says this in verse 15. You think of the death of Christ. You judge. Here's what we judge. Here's what we determine. Verse 14, if the one died for all, then all died, and that he died for all, that those for whom he died should not live for themselves should not live for themselves. To be overwhelmed with the reality of the love of Christ, the gospel truth here, ought to give to us a new motive, a new direction. We are not to live with self-interests. We are not to live with our own personal desires and interests as being supreme. But to live unto him, to live with a view to him, how can we live unto ourselves? How can we live with the view to ourselves in the light of the fact that Christ had died for us? Love of Christ constraints. Love of Christ gives a new view of life. Verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. Everything looks different. In the light of the gospel, everything else looks different. We're looking at everything through new eyes, through gospel spectacles, if you will. This constraining love causes all the allurements of the world and all the allurements of sin to lose its attractiveness. It's going to make the pursuit of holiness a thing of beauty, a new will, a new understanding, a new love, a new conscience, new imagination, all that. The old is set aside. Things are different. The old things passed away. All things become new. So we have a new look of life on life in the light of the gospel. A new mission. Verses 18 and 20 speak of our ministry of reconciliation. We're ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors are those representatives. An ambassador represents the nation that he has been commissioned by. The ambassador introduces men to the particular nation that he represents. We're ambassadors. We're ambassadors. We're representatives. As believers, we are representatives of Jesus here upon earth. We introduce men to him. So often what particular people think of a nation depends upon what they think of that ambassador. And so it is what people see in us will speak about that one or to that one that we represent how the world views us as believers, as Christians, reflects how they will view Christ. There is a very wonderful sense, and that's clear from the closing verse where we have a new standing, we have a new standing. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in God him. We have a new standing. And that's how God sees us. That's how God sees us. He sees us in Christ. You think of the imagery that Paul uses elsewhere of, of the church as being a body. Christ is the head. Christ is the head and we're the body. There's a very real sense in which God sees the body only through the head and we're accepted. God sees the body through the head. But there's a very real sense in which the world can see the head only through the body. God sees the head and we're accepted 
in the beloved. What does the world see about Christ when they see us? That ought to motivate us. That ought to be a motive to help us keep our religion real, to start thinking rightly about the gospel. This is what Paul is saying. Paul says, think right about the gospel, you're going to live right. There's always a link between thinking and behavior. So with the new motivation of the cross, with the new creation being everything new, new perspective, everything old passed away, a new relationship reconciled, a new ministry. Paul says, this, this, is, this is how I live. This is what makes me tick in the ministry, what makes me tick in life. What an example it is for us. And I say it always amazes me. When you look at even the world today and we see this cult and we see that false religion and they are so taken up with what they believe. What a tragedy it is because they're wrong and they're hell bound if they reject Jesus. But they live as though it's true. They live as though it's true. Why is it that those of us then that have the truth, that know the truth, that have a relationship with the one true and living God through the only mediator of God's elect, the only mediator between God and men, why is it that we get excited on Sunday, but yet during the week we just, no. This is religion. And God help us. God help us by his spirit to keep our religion real. Amen. O oh Lord, we are thankful for thy word that is so pointed at times, so rebuking at times, but a word that is always for our welfare and for our benefit. And we would ask, that we would have ears to hear and make us doers of thy word that will follow the example of the apostle here who is an imitator of Jesus to live in the reality of what we believe. Let there be a connection between our creed and our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.